So, um, the next speaker is Dr. Richard Tsai, also from uh, the University of California here at uh, San Francisco, and he's talking about imaging. And I'm looking forward to that talk. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. And I want to thank the organizers for inviting me here today and all the patients and their families for coming in bright and early on a Saturday. Uh, I think what Adam said earlier about disclosures is really important. So just to let everyone know that um, I do get research support from the NIH and also University of California, but I'm also an investigator in clinical trials for companies such as Biogen, AbbVie, and Eli Lilly, which are relevant to this talk. Um, so really quickly, today I'm going to talk about a, a new type of imaging called tau PET, and especially in corticobasal syndrome. So for those that don't know, uh, PET stands for positron emission tomography. It's kind of like a ca CAT scan, but we also inject something called a tracer through an IV into your blood. And this tracer has a little bit of um, radioactivity, and it's also designed to be very specific uh, to certain proteins in your brain. So when the tracer travels through your blood to your brain, it can attach to the protein that it's designed to attach to and give off a little signal. And through a computer, we can see where that signal in your brain is and with that identify whether certain proteins are, um, are present in your brain. So in the past few years, uh, beta amyloid PET scans have become very critical and important in our understanding of Alzheimer's disease and has really revolutionized the way we diagnose Alzheimer's disease and the way we conduct clinical trials in Alzheimer's disease. In fact, before the presence of beta amyloid PET, um, up to 20% of patients participating in Alzheimer's disease clinical trials didn't even have Alzheimer's disease. So you can see how important these PET tracers are. And as Adam has said earlier, now that we have more and more or new investigational drugs that are targeting tau, it's really important for us to have a PET tracer that's designed to look for tau in someone's brain. So in the past few years, there's, fine, there's been a development of a new tracer that's, uh, that's aimed at looking for tau. This tracer called uh, 18FAV1451, or fluorotalsapir, was initially developed to study the tau in Alzheimer's disease. And it's actually working pretty well. Here's a study from Rick Ossenkopley in Amsterdam uh, using this tracer in a variety of patients with different types of Alzheimer's disease. So in the first row, that's your typical late onset Alzheimer's disease, and the yellow regions are where the tracer is lighting up. So you can see it's in the parietal lobe, temporal lobe, areas that we would expect um, a late onset Alzheimer's disease patients to have lots of tau protein. The second row is early onset Alzheimer's disease, and as we expect, there's going to be a little more tau protein in the front of the brain, and that's what we see with the uh, PET scans as well. The blue one is something called a logopenic variant aphasia. It's a type of language disorder that we often see with Alzheimer's disease, and as shown there, a lot of the signal comes from the left side of the brain, that second column there, uh, which is where the language center is in most patients. And then the last row is something called posterior cortical atrophy, which is also a type of Alzheimer's disease that where the patients have a lot of visual spatial difficulties. And as you would expect, there, we would expect a lot of tau protein in the back of the brain where the occipital lobe and the visual cortex is. And that's what we see here in the PET scans. So AV1451 seems to work pretty well in Alzheimer's disease, but the problem is the tau protein in cortical basal syndrome is actually different than uh, Alzheimer's disease tau. So just a reminder, it's really hard for us clinicians to predict what the underlying protein pathology in cortical basal syndrome is. Cortical basal syndrome can be related to, uh, can have an underlying tau protein that's called cortical basal degeneration. It can also be caused by tau proteins from pro progressive supranuclear palsy. And up to a quarter of the time, it can be caused by tau protein of Alzheimer's disease. And it can also be associated with other non-tau um, neurodegenerative disease proteins like TDP43. So in this little pie chart here, you can see that in a series of patients who's gone to autopsy at UCSF, uh, who all presented with cortical basal syndrome, only about half of the time they have a tau protein from either CBD or PSP, and up to a quarter of the time if they actually have Alzheimer's disease underlying. And it's, so it's really hard for us clinicians to try to figure out what's which tau protein is under cortical basal syndrome, and you can see that would be important when we want to direct these patients to the appropriate clinical trial. 
And so I'm going to present our center's experience using AV1451 and cortical basal syndrome. So far, we've had 10 patients scanned and analyzed, and we're seeing three types of images that are coming up. The first type, type 1 right there, you see signal. Does this work? Okay. I can't, not really. Okay, you see signal here. Um, in kind of the precentral gyrus white matter, um, which is what we would expect in patients with uh, CBD tau. And um, so that seems to work pretty well. In the second type of patients, we see very little signal. So we, we, our assumption now is maybe these are the CBS patients that have underlying TDP protein pathology or other types of pathology. And more interestingly, in the last patient here, you can see that there's a very, very high signal there, much higher than the other two you see there. And all of these patients also have positive beta amyloid through a, a different PET scan. So we think that these patients here are probably CBS due to underlying Alzheimer's pathology. Next, we compared all of the patients with type 1 and type 2 scans to a bunch of patients that are age matched without any cognitive troubles. We call them normal controls. And you can see that there's elevated signal right here which is that precentral gyrus white matter area, which is where we would expect um, tau pathology to be in patients with CBD. And the redder it is means the higher signal it is. So that sort of matches our expectations. And next, this is a little tricky, but basically we took all the scans from our CBS patients and we set a threshold. So if your signal in each part of the brain is higher than the 95th percentile, we called you positive. And then we compared it across all the CBS patients to see in which areas how many patients have a positive signal. And in the same area here where we would expect to have tau pathology, we see that about four to five patients out of seven have this positive signal. So if you think back, four to five out of seven sort of matches this kind of frequency distribution. So it may be that these are the patients that have actual tau CBD or PSP tau pathology. Next, a group in Korea recently took this a step further and asked, you know, does tau pet, can a tau pet measure how severe your disease is? So they took the signal strength from this area, which would be responsible for motor symptoms, you know, like uh, rigidity, uh, lack of dexterity, dystonia, things like that, and they measured the signal strength there and compared it to something called the UPDRS here on the left which is um, a scale that clinicians use to measure how severe motor symptoms is in patients with Parkinsonian disorders. And you can see that it sort of matches in this precentral gray matter and white matter. The higher the signal you have, more towards the right, the more severe your symptoms are measured by this UPDRS. So, so far, there is some um, suggestion that this AV1451 tau pet can also measure how severe your symptoms are in CBS. Now, the next most important question is, is AV1451 actually measuring tau in the brain, or is it measuring something else? We don't really know yet, um, but so far there's only been two autopsy studies, meaning a patient had the AV1451 tau PET scan, and then soon after they passed away and they were able to donate their brain to autopsy for a scientist to really look under the microscope where the tau protein is. It's a busy slide, so I'll just focus your attention to where the red circles will appear soon. So this is the top um, is an image of the patient's brain. And you can see in the middle of the red circle, there's a very high signal in an area called the subthalamic nucleus. And here, the red circle C, you can see all the dark spots in this slide that's gone under autopsy are tau proteins. So it seemed to do pretty well. And in other areas, um, such as the um, middle central gyrus and the superior frontal gyrus, we also see that if there's a signal, there seems to be tau protein on autopsy as well. However, it, it's not perfect. There's an area here um, called the post central gyrus that the scientists found a lot of protein uh, as, uh, when the brain went to autopsy, but you can see on the scan there, there's actually not much of a signal. So it doesn't seem like this tracer is perfect. In another autopsy case done at Mayo, um, they took multiple areas of the brain and looked under a microscope to measure how much uh, tau protein there is, and that's on the left here. 
And then on the bottom here, they measure how much signal uh, they, this area of the brain gave off when the patient was still alive and had a PET scan. And also it seems to match pretty well. If there's a low signal, they don't have that much tau protein uh, when the brain went to autopsy. So, so far so good, right? Well, actually not really. This AV1451 also has a lot of troubling features that we're not quite sure what's going on. And so far, we just, we're calling them nonspecific binding because we're not sure exactly what it's binding to. For example, there are patients with a certain language disorder called um, SVPPA, or Semantic Variant Primary Progressive Aphasia. This is a type of language disorder where almost all patients, when they pass away and go under autopsy, will have an underlying protein pathology called TDP43. Very, very few of them will ever have tau. Almost over 90% of these patients will have TDP43. And so far, of the two patients scanned here, um, we can see that there's a lot of tau PET signal in an area that we would expect to have TDP40 pathology, right there and there. So we don't really know why. There, they shouldn't have tau PET signal there, but there is. We've also scanned a group of patients with a genetic mutation called C9ORF72. This is a genetic mutation that's associated with uh, frontal temporal dementia and also um, ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease. And this genetic mutation also causes a TDP43 protein pathology in the brain. You can see that in the top patient here, uh, it's a 48-year-old female with kind of moderate disease, a CDR of one, that's a dementia rating scale. You can see just a little bit of signal there, so not exactly sure what's going on there just yet. But there's a bottom patient here who's a little bit older, but in terms of a dementia rating, it's actually a little bit more mild, and you see a lot of signal here in the frontal lobe, and we're not sure what's going on there either. So. <clears throat> AV1451 also has a lot of nonspecific binding to areas that we would not expect to have tau, and that's very troubling. So more work needs to be done. Um, AV1451 binds to expected areas of tau pathology and the expected frequency of underlying uh, <clears throat> tau pathology in cortical basal syndrome as far as our center's experience and two other centers' published results. There's, so far, there's only been two cases that went to autopsy that show some correlation of tau pathology to the areas of PET signal. But like I mentioned, AV1451 has a lot of troubling nonspecific signal in other dementia syndromes that are not expected to have tau. So we need a lot more patients to participate in our imaging studies, and most importantly, we need more of these cases where patients get tau PET imaging and soon after they may pass away and donate their brain to autopsy so we can really see where in their brain there's tau protein and does it match the signals or not. So I want to thank everyone here for listening. The AV1451 ligand was provided by Avid Radio Pharmaceuticals and this work was done with the help of Adam, Gil, and um, the, these postdocs here and research coordinators. Thank you. <laughs>
All right, everybody. So let's start. I have here three questions that are actually for Larry. So um, the question number one is um, for the cluster in France. So did they really exclude any genetic causes of this cluster? Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah, okay. Um, I can't say we've excluded it because, in fact, that was, the, the slides were flying pretty fast there at the end, but one of the things that I hope to do, if we can get the French authorities to agree, is to collect DNA from all the people and look for genetic commonalities among them. But just based on genealogy, in other words, asking each of the 100 patients with PSP, what relatives do you know of who have either Parkinson's disease or Alzheimer's or any kind of dementia or PSP, none of them had any more of that stuff than anybody else, and none of them knew of any relatives with PSP. Plus, none of the, no pairs of the 100 had any, had the same last name except for a husband and wife pair. All right. And the next question is, um, are there any geographical areas with high clusters in France? But I would like to extend the question to the U.S. Anywhere because in the world. Anywhere in the world where mining, you know, 200 years ago, mm. I think we had also different um, environmental laws and we don't, ha we didn't simply have the awareness of, of these toxins and what they can do to the body. Mm. Yeah, we, we may be headed in the same direction again now. Um, <laughs> yeah. We, we don't know of any clear-cut clusters anywhere else. Uh, however, of course, you've heard of the cluster on Guadeloupe. That's not PSP, it's a different tauopathy. Uh, and, and that may be related to a, a toxin in fruits that they eat there. That's not proven. Um, but I've heard of clusters, much smaller clusters than in France, in mining-related areas in the U.S. Um, in um, Kentucky and in Colorado. I've heard of, uh, and these haven't been validated, it's very small numbers of people, but these were very rural areas with, you know, maybe four or five people in a, in a small area that had the disease. So I, I don't want to say, yes, these are statistically significant clusters. And one last question for you right now is, um, somebody wants to know um, the differences between PSP Richardson's and PSP Parkinson's. Uh, well, PSP Richardson's is um, somewhere between 40, 40 and 50 percent of all PSP. Uh, PSP Parkinsonism is maybe 25, 30 percent, and um, the rest are these other small minority ones or mixtures. And the, uh, the PSP Richardson is the classic description uh, where the eye movement problems occur by the middle of the disease course usually, and falls are among the earliest signs. Uh, with PSP Parkinson, and, and the person doesn't respond much to levodopa. With PSP Parkinsonism, they usually do respond to levodopa, at least temporarily, at least to, for a small degree, but to an, an ex a useful amount. And they don't develop the eye movement problems till later. They don't develop the falls till later. With PSP Parkinsonism, they have more tremor. Um, less likely to develop cognitive problems. Those are the main differences. Thank you. Um, just maybe a question from me then. Can you, because I hear that also quite often uh, over the phone, any comment on drinking water, well water? You know, Irene Litvin has investigated that. Maybe could you, could you just briefly comment on that? Any other environmental risk factors? Just for now, just maybe also to reduce a little bit of anxiety of those, these results in a way. What does it mean for us right now, here and today? Uh, well, in terms of uh, validated, replicated risk factors, the only one is that um, people with PSP are less likely to have advanced educations than people without PSP. Now, I know all the college grads in the audience will say, oh, that doesn't apply to me. <laughs> yeah, okay. But when you look at it statistically, there, it's very clear. I first found this in that, in that study I did back in the 1980s, and it's since been replicated by every project that has looked at it, uh, three other projects uh, in other parts of the world. 
including in the US. And it's probably, I would guess, that it's because people who have less education are a little more likely to live in, to, to have a, a job that exposes them to toxins or to live in the part of town where there's more toxins. Um, but it may be other things. It may be that more education creates more synapses in your brain so that when an insult like PSP comes along, uh, you won't show symptoms as soon. This is also the case for Alzheimer's disease, by the way. Okay, thank you. I, I did hear quite a few maybes in there, so uh, we, we unfortunately don't know yet. So, I mean, it's, it's still a matter of investigation. I have a couple of questions here for Dr. Boxer. And um, uh, number one is actually um, PSP sleep symptoms. What are they and what drug trials are underway to, I mean, I think you mentioned the one from uh, Tom Nyland you went, mentioned and Christine Walsh, but maybe you can elaborate on that a bit. Um, yeah, so this, uh, so the, so Larry actually, I think, really pointed out uh, in his PSP rating scale um, and was really the first person who really documented the sleep problems that many people I know experience, who you've, you've experienced in PSP. Um, and so uh, working uh, with support of the Tau Consortium, um, some of our colleagues, uh, Tom Nyland, who's a sleep uh, researcher at UCSF, and Christine Walsh, began to do very detailed studies of people with PSP um, using uh, where you sleep overnight and we measure brain waves and the quality of sleep and also by putting an actigraphy watch on which can actually measure over the course of weeks how well people are sleeping. Um, and found that uh, it's very interesting that um, people with PSP tend to not sleep very well at night. So wake up a lot and don't get the most restful. So your brain doesn't get into the most restful uh, uh, form of sleep. Um, and usually, if uh, for most people, that would make them really tired the next day. You Like, if you didn't sleep well the night before, you often fall asleep the next day. But strangely, what's been now clearly documented, and there's a new paper that just came out in the journal Sleep from, from our group with them, um, that it, it, people with PSP who don't sleep well are not that sleepy. The next day, they can't fall asleep. Or they might feel sleepy, but they just can't fall asleep again. So it's, it's really a double whammy. You don't sleep well at night, and you can't fall asleep the next day. And um, there's another piece of evidence that there have been a variety of small reports of sort of anecdotal, uh, anecdotally that certain people transiently benefited from sleep medicines. One is called uh, Ambien or, or Zolpidem and, and felt that really after taking Zolpidem, at least for a few weeks, they really felt better overall. Uh, and so based on this uh, and the work from, from Tom and Christine, um, we've really been very interested in whether improving sleep uh, could really improve people's life and maybe even, you know, help with the disease. Uh, and so um, the nice thing is that there are many different sleep medicines that are already approved and marketed in this country. And so uh, what we want to do is try to um, use different sleep medicines that work on different mechanisms in the brain to try and get a better understanding whether one might be better for patients with PSP. If that's true, does it really help them to feel better? And, and also, does that tell us more about the disease? So this trial, which has not yet started but is funded, we hope it'll start in maybe three to four months, will um, send, uh, just will study the effects of two common sleep medicines over the course of a week versus placebo in people. And the idea is that we can use our research network artful, so people who've already had a verified diagnosis through that network um, will, so, so we know you really have PSP, well then um, we can mail you a card which has a, which is, you know, we're all blinded to what you're receiving during one week or another and then uh, we'll collect information over phone calls, the registry, um, and other uh, diaries and, and find out which, if any of these sleep medicines really makes your life better or, you know, God forbid, uh, makes you feel worse. But this, I think, is going to um, hopefully advance our understanding of sleep. Yeah, that's very exciting. And um, it doesn't. So it turns out that CBD is different and the sleep problem, there are sleep problems in CBD, but um, they're not this unique problem that, that really we see in PSP. Um, and so we, we need to do a little bit more work to really um, rationally think about the best way to treat the sleep problems in CBD. So we're not quite there yet, but we're on the way. And stay tuned. Um, we spoke to Dr. Box's colleagues yesterday, and we agreed that we will publish uh, 
the when you start recruiting patients that goes on our Facebook site, on our news website, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we will, you know, try to digest this and bring it also to you. Um, the second question was also a good question about salsalate, and uh, isn't that basically um, aspirin? And what does my baby aspirin pill do? Yeah. So so it turns out so. Um, uh, Aspirin is, is chemically called acetyl salicylic acid, and um, salicylate is disalicylic acid. So they're, they're chemical brothers and sisters, but they're technically very different. And um, my, our basic science research colleague, Dr. Lee Gann, who works at the Gladstone Institute um, in, in San Francisco, uh, recognized a number of years ago that on the tau protein, there's this chemical modification called acetylation. Um, and there's something about that chemical reaction that goes on the tau that makes it a lot stickier and more toxic to cells. And that's probably one of the earliest stages in many of these diseases. And so working with some of her colleagues, she tried to find, well, what medicines could affect the acetylation of the tau protein? And it turns out that there's this medicine, um, a salsalate, which has been around for hundreds of years. Actually, it's so old that it predates the US FDA. Um, that, uh, that actually really is a potent inhibitor of the, of the enzyme or the protein that, that chemically modifies tau to add ac ac um, acetyl groups. Um, and the funny thing, though, is aspirin doesn't do this. So it's really specific to salsalate. And there's, she's actually working on finding new, even more potent compounds that do this. So um, if you take aspirin, unfortunately, it probably doesn't help. Um, you could have your doctor prescribe salsalate. It is uh, available in pharmacies. Most people take a fairly high dose. And many years ago, before people started taking a lot of aspirin or, or um, ibuprofen, this was a, a medicine that many people use for arthritis. Um, so we know it's safe uh, in most people. It still has the risks of aspirin, like uh, a GI uh, prob problems and bleeding, but still relatively safe. And so we want to study whether we can see, to the, at least to the first uh, uh, approximation, whether the effects that we measure in patients with PSP and also with Alzheimer's disease of taking salsalate are similar to the mouse models that Dr. Gann used in terms of the chemistry of tau. So if we can show just that the chemistry of tau in humans is being affected by this drug the same way as in the mice, and that really suggests we should do a big study and see if it's an effective treatment. So that's what we're trying to do now. And uh, one last question for you is regarding the rehab study you mentioned at the beginning of your talk. Um, these positive effects were seen, like what's the daily exercise regimen? Is it daily, weekly, twice a day, twice a week? Do you remember that by any chance? Yeah, I don't remember. It was a very intensive rehab regimen. And actually, this is in this journal called a PLOS One, so it's freely downloadable by everyone. Mm -hmm. It's a free article. Yeah. You can get it on the internet, um, so you can find all the details. But it was a multidisciplinary, and I think it was an inpatient rehabilitation program where people got, you know, every day practically speech, occupational, physical therapy. It was only a two-month study, so this is only a really a month of intervention, and we don't know how long the effects last. But that being said, even over the course of the month, there really were improvements yeah. on average in people who did this. It's called Public Library of Science One, PLOS One. And here's one question that's actually for Richard and you, um, regarding identifying PSP early without symptoms, how is this done and where, you know, pre-symptomatic that we, we, you know, Adam mentioned that as well, but I think also that leads over to your efforts in imaging. Um, well, if a patient is pre-symptomatic, then we would have to rely on biomarkers, which could be imaging or proteins we measure in the blood or CSF. So we have looked at a bunch of, uh, I think, around 30 patients with PSP using the tau PET imaging I described earlier. Of course, these are symptomatic patients, um, but when we compare them to a, bunch of, a group of normal patients comparing the scans, we do see elevated tau PET signals in areas that you would expect tau pathology in PSP patients, such as the basal ganglia and midbrain. Um, we don't really know whether we using the same type of scan in patients who are in a very mild stage of disease or even before that would show the same type of signal, but it's certainly something worthwhile to look at.
Yeah, so, so there's this idea of biomarkers, which are basically measurements that we can make in a person that tell us about the biology that's going on in their brain. And um, we have really good biomarkers for Alzheimer's disease where we can detect evidence of the disease long before people get sick. And this has allowed for Alzheimer's disease new treatments to be deployed prior to the onset of symptoms. We don't have this yet for PSP, but we have ways, we have ideas of how to get to that point. So number one is um, everyone who's been very generous to participate in this research, many people are being extremely generous, generous to donate spinal fluid. And we think that looking in spinal fluid is gonna allow us to find protein first in people who are symptomatic with disease, but then we can look also in people who are asymptomatic who don't uh, to find a signature of protein abnormalities. There's even evidence now in blood that there may be abnormalities with a blood test that eventually, we're not anywhere near there yet, but eventually even with a blood test we may be able to find evidence of this. And we actually published a study um, where we looked at healthy older people. We measured actually this protein tau that we've been talking about in their blood and we found that um, certain people have slightly, very slight elevations of tau protein in their blood. It's coming from their brain probably. Um, and if you look genetically, um, at these people, um, they all have one strong risk factor that's associated with elevated tau in their blood, and it's the same risk factor. It's called um, tau H1C haplotype that's known to be a risk factor for PSP and CBD. Now, it doesn't mean that so 99.9% .9 of these healthy people will not get CBD or PSP, but it gives us the idea that we could potentially look at blood proteins as a way to find early disease. Right. Um, one card said also you... Um Dr. Sai, you mentioned that the tracer is radioactive. Can you just very briefly, because we're running out of a bit of time here, uh, just comment on that? Yeah. So the, the tracer is radioactive. Uh, they're usually made in a, in a lab with a, something called a cyclotron. Uh, the radioactivity is actually very, very low and usually doesn't last for, uh, for example, the amyloid scans. The tracers can last anywhere from 10 minutes to a few hours. And for the tau scan, it's just a few hours. And uh, um, the, the, the strength of the radioactivity is actually very low as well. Um, of course, any radioactivity can increase the risk of cancer, but going through this tau PET scan, the amount, uh, the increased risk of cancer is so low that we get, can't even put a number on it. It's less than 1% increase. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a question for Diana. Um, so with the registry, you said that there is a 50-50% split uh, between contact registry and research registry. So there is no automatic overflow once you are in the contact registry. That doesn't mean automatically you are registered for being contacted for clinical trials. Is that correct? Right. So the, the contact registry, there's... Uh, you will get access to our Find a Study page, and you will get general announcements in, in uh, emails and newsletters, but you won't necessarily get the same sort of targeted contact that you would if, if you were participating in the research registry. The additional consent to participate in research and filling out those additional surveys allow us c to collect very specific information about you that allow us to send those very targeted emails to you that would help determine if you're eligible for a study or not. So if you're interested in more of that level of interaction, you need to go through that extra registration step to participate in research. Right, and I also would like to point out that um, uh, in our spring newsletter, we had Diana and the registry featured. So if you want to go also to our website or their website, I mean, you, of course, you can register right away. But we strongly encourage you to register. And obviously, it would be fantastic if you also registered for the research website uh, registry because we need, we need you. We need everybody of you in clinical trials, and we need to increase the numbers. Um, so we're very thankful for this organization and we would like to really endorse the registry wholeheartedly. I have another question for um, Dr. Lee. Is there any way of uh, boosting polyamines or is there any food or medicine? And maybe a question from my side is as well, how far are we away from the clinics with that? Um, Lots of questions, sorry. <laughs> unfortunately, uh, there's not a lot of research on polyamines and neurodegenerative diseases as far as tau. Um, you 
typically you get polyamines, there's, it's highly enriched in your diet. A lot of plants, a lot of salads, fruits. Um, so they're natural molecules. The, uh, the problem is that the pathway, the metabolism, somehow becomes disrupted during this neurodegenerative disease. And we're not quite sure why. Um, as far as boosting the levels right now, we don't have any drugs that can do that. But the good thing is that the enzymes that are boosting them and the enzymes that are inactivating them, they can be drugged. All right, so they're druggable targets. The pathway is druggable, but we haven't developed any clean drugs that can manipulate it from that perspective. So in my lab, unfortunately, we're, we're resulting to gene therapy to try to just really understand what's going on with the pathway, how, how does it affect the tau clumping, the aggregation, the, um, and the behavior. They affect behavior as well. Um, so uh, this is kind of a newer area that uh, we, we, you know, thanks to PSP, I'm actually working on. Um, but um, we're not quite there yet. <laughs> I don't want to end this session on that. Uh, so there's a lot of hope, and I think this panel really speaks for hope and a lot of clinical trials and clinical research being done, but also on the preclinical side, as you could see with Dr. Lee. But, you know, the clinical team and also the the clinical research organizing team with uh, Dr. Diana Wheaton, they're really, um, really working hard for you to bring PSP research forward. And with that, I would like to thank all speakers again.